when we are factoring, we are on page four of the notes, is taking out a GCF, the biggest number and variable that I can take out of everybody. So looking at this problem over here, what's the biggest number that I can take out of eight and four and two? Why two. And what's the greatest number of x's we can take out? We got x4, x3, x2. So x squared would be the greatest amount. So I gotta look for the biggest number and the biggest variable that I can take out of everybody. So don't forget folks, we always wanna check for the GCF first when we're factoring because sometimes that's gonna be the only way that you can factor at all. So number one, always check for a GCF first. Number two, difference of squares. Now this one we saw back in unit four. Difference of squares is when I have a perfect square for my first term, a perfect square for my second term, and a minus sign in between. So that would give me um, a squared, whole, uh, sorry, a squared minus b squared. We can factor that as a plus b and a minus b. So my perfect square factors of a squared, a and a, perfect square factors of b squared, b and b. One gets a plus and one gets a minus. That way our outside, inside products cancel when we are boiling those. I do want you to put a side note by this one though because let's say that I have x squared plus 25. Can I factor that? Can I do this? x plus 5, x plus 5. Why doesn't that work? What happens if we fo 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 foil it? We would get x squared plus 5x plus 5x plus 25. So this would give me 10x for a middle term, so that's not going to work. If I try to do x plus 5 and x minus 5, that's not going to work either because that would give me a negative 25 for my product number. Two minus signs will give me a negative 10x. So here's the dealio when your first and second item are perfect squares and there's a plus sign, it is automatically prime. So there is no sum of squares. So no sum of squares. So if you see sum of squares when you're trying to factor, you can automatically say that that is prime. Our next two methods of factoring, and this is what's going to be new for today, are sum and difference of cubes. So remember this sheet that we had back in unit four? You might still have yours, you might not. Um, this has a list of all of the perfect squares on it, in one included. But it also has a list of all the perfect cubes on it. So we're getting pretty good at identifying the perfect squares because we use them for simplifying square roots and for factoring. But cubes are a little bit less intuitive. So let's go ahead and start with one. One cubed is one. Two cubed, or two times two times two, is eight. Three cubed, three times three times three, is 27. Four cubed is 64. So 64 is one of those unique numbers because it is a perfect cube, four cubed, it is also a perfect square, eight squared. So 64 is a special number that falls into both of those categories. So these cubes we're going to kind of keep in our back pocket as we start trying to factor the expressions below. So looking at problem A, the first thing we're going to do is check for a GCF. Is there a number or variable I can divide out of both of those? Nope x cubed plus 8, no number I can take out, no variables. So there is no GCF. But as I'm looking at this, x cubed is a perfect cube, just like x squared is a perfect square. So x cubed is a perfect square. Is 8 a perfect square? But is it a perfect cube? Yes. So since 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, 8 is a perfect cube. So this is my initial setup for sum of cubes. I've got a perfect cube plus another perfect cube. And then I'm going to follow this formula. Now, folks, you can memorize the formula if you wish. I like to think of factoring these as more of a visual process. So step one in this process is I like to rewrite it as the basis being cubed. So rewrite as bases cubed. So 
So we're going to trot on down to this problem and say, what cubed gives me x cubed? x. So x cubed gives me x cubed. And this is important because in this factoring process, everything is based off of a and b, not a cubed and b cubed. So we always want to revert to those bases first because that's what the rest of the factoring process depends on. So then what about 8? What cubed will give me 8? Two. So that's step number one is rewriting it as what bases give me those perfect cubes. Step number two is we're going to make a little parenthesis big enough for a binomial and a big parenthesis big enough for a trinomial. So little parenthesis, big parenthesis, or medium parenthesis and giant parenthesis. So when we factor sum and difference of cubes, you will always have a binomial in the first parenthesis and a trinomial in the second parenthesis. And what's interesting about this is it's not like we've done with regular factoring in the past where it's like, I'm looking for a product, I'm looking for a sum, where I kind of have to do a little bit of guesswork. This is a very direct formulaic process. So we're going to start with our little parenthesis and our big parenthesis. And our next step, is to put the signs into the parenthesis. And how we put those signs in is using the SOAP acronym. S-O-A-P. Where S is going to stand for same, O is going to stand for opposite, and AP always positive. Same. Opposite, always positive. Same, opposite, always positive. Soap, 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 soap. So that's kind of nice because as we start this process, all of our signs are going to be locked in for us. So let's go ahead and try this with this problem. Same means same as the sign that's between the two cubes. So same sign would be a plus sign. Opposite would be opposite of the sign that you just wrote. So a minus sign. Make sure you leave some space in front of that minus sign because we are going to have to fit a term in front of it and behind it and another sign. Then always positive. You guessed it. Always positive. Always a plus sign. So little parenthesis, big parenthesis, signs locked in with the SOAP acronym. Now our next step is going to be following this format. So what I like to do is just drop the bases down into the first parenthesis. So x and 2. First parenthesis is done. So that's why we want to rewrite it as the original basis first because that's what's going to go in our first parenthesis. In the next parenthesis, we are going to use the first base squared. That's our a squared here. And what is our a squared? This x squared. In the last slot, we are going to have the other base squared. So our other base squared would be 2 squared. Then for our middle term, we have a times b. So these two bases just multiplied together which gives me 2x. And if you're like, but that's positive, 2x is 0. We don't worry about the signs because they are locked in using that SOAP acronym. So we're just focusing on the positive values that we get from all of that base stuff. So simplifying, we've got 2 squared. So we can go ahead and simplify that to be 4. I threw my uh, No, you threw it away. Have a good weekend. So folks, I do want you to show it as 2 squared in your notes first, just so you remember, oh, it's base squared here, it's base squared there. But when you actually write your factorization, we want to simplify that to be 4. And there it is. 
that's our factored form. So it's not guessing and checking like regular factoring. It's very systematic and it's all based off of the perfect base cubes. So let's go through that process one more time. We start by identifying x as a perf cube and 8 as a perf cube because 2 cubed gives me 8. We rewrite these as the bases that give us those cubes. So from there, little parenthesis, big parenthesis, SOAP acronym, same, opposite, always positive. Then we drop our bases into the first parenthesis, base squared in my next slot, other base squared in the last slot, and then multiply them together for that middle term. So totally different from the factoring we've done before. Let's go ahead and take a look at our next one. Do I have a GCF? First thing we want to check for. Nope, nothing I can take out of 8 cubed, nothing I can take out of 27. 8 cubed, as soon as I see that power of 3, it's like, oh, we got a perfect cube. Is 27 a perfect cube? What cube gives me 27? 3. three. So let's go ahead and rewrite that as the bases that give me the cubes. So what cube gives me 8 cubed? Little old 8. What cube gives me 27? 3. Then I make my little parenthesis binomial, big parenthesis for the trinomial. Next, let's go ahead and put in our signs using the SOAP acronym. So same, opposite, always positive. Same, same as the sign between the cubes, which would be a plus, plus sign. Opposite, opposite of the sign that you just wrote, pew. And always positive, Always positive. So that structure is the same for sum of cubes and difference of cubes. It's just that your same and opposite will be different from what they were for the sum of cubes. So now, in the first parenthesis, we drop our first base, A. We drop our second base, 3. And then A squared goes in the next slot. So we square the base, and then what will go in the last slot of this parenthesis? 3 squared, or 9. In the middle, we're going to have a times 3, or 3a. So bases, base squared, base squared, base times base. And that is our factored form. Now, if you're a little skeptical, are you guys feeling skeptical today? And if you're going, you're telling me that that is the factorization of that scuzzy little binomial that we actually get that big, long factorization, and that actually works. Folks, what is the opposite of factoring? Foiling or super foiling in this case. So if I want to check myself to make sure that this actually works... We can superfoil this to see if we get the same polynomial that we started with. So let's go ahead and go for it. A times A squared, A cubed. No, you don't have to write this in your notes. A times negative 3A, negative 3A squared. A times 9, ooh, my 9s really look like A's, so 9A. 3 times A squared, 3A squared. 3 times negative 3A, negative 9A. And 3 times 9 is 27. Goodbye to negative 3a and positive 3a. Goodbye to positive 9a and negative 9a. And all we are left with is a cubed plus 27. So it is kind of annoying to check your work, kind of like doing synthetic division after doing long division. It's kind of annoying to check your work, but you can still do it if you're worried about memorizing this formula for factoring. What questions do we have so far after seeing these two problems? All right, let's go ahead and skedaddle down to problem D next. Now, as I look at this one, it's almost exactly the same as problem A, except for one slight detail. That slight detail is the sign between those perf cubes. So these two were sum of cubes because I am adding between the perfect cubes. This one is difference of cubes. But what's nice is 
the process is still the same. We first rewrite it as the bases that give me those cubes. So what cube gives me x cubed? x. What cube gives me 8? 2. Little parenthesis, big parenthesis. And then our SOAP acronym again. But this time when we use SOAP, the S stands for same, same as the sign between the cubes. Well, what sign is between my cubes this time? Minus. A minus. So different from what we factored up here, but the process of SOAP is still the same. Opposite then is opposite of the sign we just wrote. So a plus sign. And always positive, that, that one's always gonna be positive. Pew. On your own, see if you can fill in the slots for this one. So I had a kid who broke out in a rash this morning in the office, like nurse's office, gave him a Benadryl. How many of you have ever taken Benadryl before? Have you ever taken it on a school day and stayed awake? <laughs> yeah, you, you can't have allergy problems when you are in a coma, so Benadryl, be careful. All right, folks, dropping down to our first parenthesis. We bring on down those bases, so X and 2. What goes in the first slot of the next parenthesis? x squared, the base squared. In the last slot, the other base squared, so 4. And what goes in the middle? x times 2 or 2x. Now, don't get hung up on the fact that, oh, wait, is that a negative? Is it x times negative 2? The signs are already locked in. We are just multiplying those items together to fill in the rest of the structure. So, boom, that's our factored form. The next one, I would put a little star by. Do we have a GCF? Nope, no number we can take out of both, no variable we can take out of both. But this one is different because our cubed variable has a coefficient. So I've got x cubed and y cubed, those are perfect cubes. But the coefficient has to be a perfect cube as well. Is 64 per cube? Sure is. So 4 times 4 times 4 gives me 64. So both the coefficient and the variable are perfect cubes. So let's go ahead and do another one here. So when we go to write this as what base cubed gives me 64x cubed, I have to think about the base number and the base variable. So I would say, what cubed gives me 64? 4. What cubed gives me x cubed? x. So a lot of times students will forget the 4. They'll forget to include the coefficient when they bring it down to the base. So what cubed gives me y cubed? y. Little parenthesis, big parenthesis. See if you can take it from here. Use your SOAP acronym and fill in the slots. Same, same as the sign between the parentheses. Opposite, opposite of the sign we just wrote. Always positive, always positive. We bring down our bases first. So 4x and the y. I want you to draw a happy little circle around our next slide. Folks, when I square the base, I have to square both the number and the variable. So am I going to put 4x squared or 16x squared? 16x squared. So I square the number and I square the variable. So careful with that. Those coefficient ones are a bit tricky. In our last slot, we have y squared. And what's going to go in that middle slot? 4xy.
So totally different from the X method, totally different from difference of squares. And we still always have to check for a GCF. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at problem C. Now on C, hmm, if you're looking at this going, you know, 16 is a perfect square. It's not a perfect cube. You are right. But before we write prime and say, I don't have perfect cubes here, what's the very first thing we always check for? A GCF. So third block really <laughs> struggled with this one. So what's the biggest number I can take out of both of those? 54 was really throwing them for a loop. So when in doubt, check on your calculator. Uh, they started with 8. 16 is divisible by 8, but it's 56 divisible by 8, not 54. Um, what about 4? 16 is divisible by 4, but if you check 54, that's going to be a no as well. So not 8, not 4, but they are both even, so what's looking good? 2. So let's take that 2 out. And, 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 is there anything else we can take out of both of those? One scuzzy X. So again, we're not just checking for the biggest number we can take out of both. We also want to check for the biggest variable. So GCF. And that is why we always check for a GCF first. It makes our number smaller, and sometimes taking out the GCF is the only way we can factor, and sometimes it actually changes the problem so that we can factor it further. So take out that 2x, we get 8x cubed, hmm. and then we take out a 2x from 54, and that leaves me with 27y cubed. Can we factor this a little bit further? Well, we've got x cubed, so maybe we've got some indifference of cubes. Is 8 a perfect cube? Yep. yep. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. We've got 27. That's a perfect cube number. And y cubed, which is a perfect cube variable. So we got cubes all over the place, so we're going to be able to factor this as sum of cubes. So first, what base cube gives me 8x cubed? And what base cube gives me 27y cubed? 2x for the 8x cubed, and 3y for the 3y cubed. Take it from here. Show me that factorization. Parentheses, same, opposite, always positive. And we'll see if you guys fall into the trap on this. First parenthesis, 2x plus 3y, wait, 3y, raise your hand if you got that right. In our next parenthesis, what's this first term going to be? 4x squared. When we square that base, it's the number and the variable. In our last slot, then, it's got to be 9y squared. Middle term, we multiply those bases together, and we get 6x squared. Y. And this is wrong. If you go, what? It's not that it's wrong, I guess. It's that we're missing something in the factorization. Anybody see what it is? The 2x. So don't forget to bring down that GCF. That is part of our factorization because this needs to be equal to the same polynomial that we started with. And without that 2x, this stuff would not be equal to that stuff. And it's also important because sometimes your GCF will give us a root or a solution with our polynomial. So we got to make sure that we always include it with our final answer, even if it feels like a fussy little detail. That was a tough one. That's about the toughest one that can come your way. GCF first, coefficient. Any questions so far? How about the next one? So, y cubed is a perfect cube. Yay. x cubed is a perfect cube. But why are we not going to be able to do anything with this one? Nine's a perfect square. Nine's a perfect square. 
and five is a perfect square. So because I wouldn't be able to write this as something cubed, I can't put anything in there that's gonna give me nine, we are stuck. There's no GCF, so what do we say when we can't factor it? Prime. That's prime, baby, so prime. Now back in unit four, when we couldn't factor something, what did we have to do to solve? We had a single thong and do the quadratic formula. Now, if you're getting worried, like, oh my God, is there a polynomial formula? The good news is no, but the bad news is also no. So there's no formula for solving polynomials that can't be factored. Instead, we are going to use P over Q values, which I think is fun. I think you guys will think it's fun once you get the hang of it, but do make sure that you bring your calculators with you next week so that we can look at the graphs and figure out what those solutions are. No questions? Mm, let's go ahead and take a quick break before we move on to the difference of squares problems. I'll see if I can find you guys some more memes, some non-daylight savings time memes. Because we can't do sum of squares mm -hmm. and they have to be perfect cubes together or perfect squares together. Okay. The coefficient and the variable have to be the same perfect. I gotta go back in time. I think in third block we've gone all the way back to my 2018 memes. Wow. Yeah, completely different time. Pre-COVID, what was the world? Have you guys ever seen a wolf spider before? One time there was a wolf spider like this big. I think I already told you guys about the wolf spider that like exploded, right? Because he was like carrying an egg sac. So when I stepped on it, it erupted into hundreds of spiders. That was traumatizing. But one time I had a wolf spider sitting in the corner of my bathroom. And I'm serious, the spider was so big, I threw a lotion bottle at it. Like something so big. I'm like, this, this is the rational way to kill this bug. So, oh my gosh. Where are you guys' experiences with wolf spiders? Do you see them in your house or in your garage? No. Oh, out of the shower dream? Well, I'm going to have nightmares. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Do they live in dreams? I don't know. It's a long story. Yuck. Did I tell you guys my snake story? I once had a snake in my apartment. That was great. Uh, we were living in the basement of a house at a time, and the people who had lived there before, like, had a pet snake, and they got out. And it was a king snake, so, you know, probably, like, probably, like, this long. I think they get to be, like, three feet long. So, anyway, we've been living there for a few months, and then one day, I come out into the living room, and there's just straight up a snake on the floor. And we're like, oh, my gosh, great. So, my husband, boyfriend at the time, was already at work, called him a few times, so I'm like, oh, my gosh, if... I go to work right now, the snake is going to go back into hiding. Like, we've been living there for three months, which is horrifying to think that the snake was just chilling around. 
So I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if it was poisonous, so I like used a coat hanger, kind of scooped him up by his middle and put him in a box. Just ran outside the house, set him by the curb. The neighbors were like, what's in the box? I'm like, a snake. So I think they ended up taking him to the nearest pet store and probably getting some money off of it. But yeah, probably the bravest thing I ever did was handle a snake in the apartment. So, And I, I'm okay with snakes. I had a couple of friends who had pet snakes. It's like, yeah, I'll let them sit on my arm. But like a snake I know nothing about that's big in the middle of my living room, not okay. That did not bite. All right, folks, so let's go ahead and do you guys have pet snakes? Creepy crawler things. <laughs> Had a few incidences with bats too. We'll talk about the bats later. All right, folks. Difference of squares. This is a review for us. So we did it with quadratics. The only difference. The only difference is we're going to be using it for these non-quadratic terms as well. So we look at x squared. That's a perfect square. Is 16 a perfect square? Yeah. So to factor that. We take the perfect square factors of x squared, x and x, perfect square factors of 16, 4 and 4. 1 gets a plus, 1 gets a minus, so that those outside and inside products will cancel each other out. Now, on a problem like this for a GCF first, mm, nothing I can take out of both of those, but I see that 9 is a perfect square, a squared is a perfect square, and 64 is a perfect square. So this is difference of squares because all the stuff is perfect squares. So we've got one parenthesis and another parenthesis. Now careful, what are my perfect square factors of 9a squared? 3a and 3a. Perfect square factors of 64, 8 and 8. One gets a plus, one gets a minus. And that's it. And remember, having that difference of squares shortcut is nice because on a problem like that, we have to use the X method, which it works, it's longer, it's more work. So having those difference of squares on your radar is a good idea. We jump into the next one. X squared is a perfect square. And then, oh, oh is 14 a perfect square? No. That's a no. So there's no GCF. Is there any way for me to factor a two-term item like this that isn't difference of squares or difference of cubes? If there's no GCF, nope, we are out of luck. So this B prime. So that's also what's kind of nice too. No GCF, not uh, difference of squares or some difference of cubes. We're done. Can't be anything else. So let's go ahead and look at D. Is We'll start with 36. 36 is definitely a perfect square. 6 times 6. What about x to the 4th? What can I multiply times itself to give me x to the fourth? X, no, x, squared x squared. So thinking of our math spam rules, if I have x squared times x squared, we can add those exponents, and that gives me x to the fourth. So both of these are perfect squares. Perfect square factors of x to the fourth are x squared and x squared. Perfect square factors of 36 are 6 and 6. 1 gets a plus and 1 gets a minus. Before I put a box around this, can I factor that a little bit further? We should check, because I did end up with quadratics in here. No GCF here, no middle term. Yep, prime. This one, ooh, do we have difference of squares again? X squared is a perfect square. Ooh, but 6 isn't a perfect square. So always check to see if you can factor it further. And if you can't, you are done. Put a box around it. All right, folks. That is all the notes we are doing today. We are now going to be skedaddling into the homework packet.